Well, good morning, Lambda Jan. It's very nice to be here. Um, I do please um, uh, give me some uh, ask questions during the talk. I'll be watching the um, the Slack channel um, while I'm talking. There's a 30 second delay, but we'll manage that. Um, but it would reassure me. Like, are are any of you actually there? So please uh, please type things in there. Good. This is a um, this is a technical talk, but I'd I really like you to um, to stay on board and to stay with me throughout because I, I think you I think you can get to the end um, without much difficulty. So, here's the problem. Here's the problem. We want to find in a program term we want to find all the equivalent sub expressions and do something like common sub expression analysis. So here's an example in which I've got a function with two occurrences of the sub expression x plus one, and I just like to share them with a the let. Um, so this is usually called common sub expression elimination. But another variant of this kind of thing is simply to save space when representing program trees. And as we'll see, that's subtly different to um, uh, to sharing program terms in common sub expression elimination. So that's more or less the problem. Um, but I want to add one gloss to the problem, which is this, uh, that we'd like to analyze um, the expression to find equivalent sub-expressions, but then we'd like to make a small rewrite somewhere in the big expression that we started with, and then fix up the analysis so that we're still tracking all equivalent sub-expressions. So that is, we'd like an incremental algorithm in which we can make a small change to the input and make a small change to the um, uh, equivalence classes, rather than starting again from scratch. So we want an, an, an incremental story. So this would be appropriate if you were building a compiler that was doing rewrites as it went. Um, great. Oh, look, where's, there's some where's, where he is in the, in the Slack channel. Thank you. That's very reassuring. Um, so uh, idea number one is just to use hash consing, right? I think you probably all know about hash consing. You say every node in the tree has a hash value. And when you're building a new node, say that x plus one node, you first of all compute the hashes of the, um, of the children. Um, and then you compute the hash of the new node from the hashes of the children um, and maybe the plus operator. You look it up in a global hash table. And if it's not there, you allocate the node and insert it in the hash table. And if it is there, you just reuse the existing one. So it's just like a memo function, really. We're taking the, the node constructor functions and we're just memoizing it in this table. Um, and one nice thing about hash consing, by the way, is that it's very incremental, right? So if you make a small rewrite, every new node that you construct after the rewrite, you just take the hashes of the children and look them up in the hash table and extend the hash table. The hash table will remember essentially everything you've ever seen. OK, so this is very nice, very incremental, very fast, no problem, right? But it doesn't work very well when you have lambda. So here's an example. Um, this, is, um, uh, um, uh, this is a program that has a couple of sub-expressions, x plus 1, but they're not the same because those x plus 1s are bound by different lambdas. OK, so... Um, uh, you might, um, uh, for structure sharing, where your aim, um, your aim is only to save memory, it's fine to share them. But for common sub-expressions, totally not, right? You couldn't possibly say let t equal x plus 1 in, and then because t, x wouldn't be in scope. So for common sub-expression, we have to regard these as separate, regarding them as the same as a kind of false positive. Okay, those of you having video trouble, I hope you can sort it out. I don't think I can help you. Um, now, it's easy to avoid these kind of source po false positives um, just by the expedient of making every lambda um, have a different binder, right? So we have, instead of using lambda x both times, we could use um, lambda y uh, instead. And that would avo avoid these kind of false positives. Um, but really, the, the, the meta goal of this particular slide is to say um, we can avoid it, but we do need to be clear about what we mean by equivalence. The equivalence for structure sharing and equivalence for common sub-expression are different. And you might have other equivalences um, a bit as well. Okay, um, now here is an example though in which we might get a false negative, right? So here is some um, uh, an ex uh, with uh, this, this program has two sub expressions lambda x x plus one and lambda y y plus one, and you and I know that these are morally the same thing. They are actually alpha equivalent, right? We would like to share those and change that into g applied to t and t with that you know, if we were doing just doing common sub expression. So here is something that but that hash counting will not discover. Look, yeah, hopefully we're back in back in back in sync. Good. Uh, so what was I saying here? Here are two expressions with, uh, is an expression with two lambda expressions that look different, but you and I know they are the same. They're alpha equivalent. And we'd like to share them, right, in the in, in the bottom. Let t equal x, lambda x, x plus one, and g about to t and t, right? Because they are alpha equivalent. Okay, 
So um, hash counting doesn't do this. So here's an example with um, you know x plus one and y plus one, and these of course have different hashes, and they should be different, right? X and y, well they're different nodes, they have different hashes, um, and uh, the one node that has the same hash, namely four. Uh, in this case, the little um, uh, brown numbers are meant to be the hash codes, and when I hash them together, the x plus one, I'm going to get a hash of twelve and a hash of eight for the other one, and they should be different. They are different terms, x plus one, y plus one, different terms. But if I stick a lambda on the top, now the hash counting would, you know, if we just treated it naively, have different hashes. But of course, this time we want them to be the same. So that is a problem, right? Um, and it's not simple to comp compute the hash of um, lambda x, x plus one, from the hash of x plus one, or the hash of lambda y, y plus one, from the hash of y plus one. We'd have to look at the whole term again, and that's not very efficient. So this is the first point at which something interesting has happened. I hope you got the sense of why hash consing just doesn't work in a straightforward way with lambdas. It, 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 that is, it has false negatives. It, it, it treats things are different, it should be the same. Um, if, if any of that's obscure, ask a question, I'll catch up with you. Now, what to do? Well, the first obvious thing to do is to use De Bruyne notation. So many of you will be um, uh, familiar with De Bruyne notation, but here's, uh, here's what we do. We remove the names from all the lambdas. So at the top, I've written lambda x, lambda y, x plus y times x. And at the bottom, I've written it in De Bruyne notation. Um, and you can see that lambdas don't have any names with them anywhere, it's just lambda dot and lambda dot. And instead, we replace every variable with our sort of hash and then a number. And the number is the number of intervening lambdas between that position and the lambda that binds it. So for the x, um, but before the, the x plus something, the x thing, that x has one lambda, namely the lambda y, intervening between the occurrence of x and the binder of x. So we write hash one. On the other hand, the y has no lambdas intervening between the binding, the binding lambda and this occurrence y, so it's hash zero. Okay. And at first sight, this seems pretty good because now we've sort of canonicalized um, our lambda. So they only so lambda x x plus one and lambda y y plus one, they'd be the same in De Bruyne notation. So that looks pretty good. Um, but unfortunately, it really isn't good. And I didn't realize this for ages. So I'm just going to uh, um, explain this to you quickly. Firstly, on the side, let me note that using De Bruyne notation for your lambdas in your compiler, say, has a global and pervasive impact on everything else, right, and imposes some significant overheads of its own. For example, if you do substitution, you have to run around readjusting indices. That's not very cool. Um, but much worse from our point of view today is that using De Bruyne notation suffers from both false positives and false negatives. And here they are. So here's a false negative. Look, um, I've got uh, in this expression, I've got a lambda t on the outside, and I've got an f applied to two lambdas. Um, and inside the right-hand lambda is a lambda x, x plus t. And the first argument is a lambda x, x plus t. And we'd like to share those. So we'd like to be able to say, let h equal lambda x, x plus t, and then f applied to h, and lambda y dot h. Nothing wrong with that. But alas, if we convert it to lambda notation, sorry, to De Bruyne notation, look what we get. The, the, um, the lambda x, x plus t, I write hash zero for the x and hash one for the t in the first one. But in the second one, I have two lambdas and then hash zero for that x again. Oh, hash two for the t because there are two lambdas intervening between the occurrence of the t and the binder of the t, right? So these two identical lambda terms have now got, they're different even in De Bruyne notation. That's very sad. So we've got false negative there. And we also get false positives. Um, so here's an example. Um, let's look carefully at this. Uh, let's see. This is, it looks similar, but it's not the same, right? So the first lambda here is lambda x t plus x. So that in De Bruyne notation is lambda dot hash one plus hash zero. The hash one is the t, one lambda intervening. The uh, hash zero is the x, no lambdas intervening. And then in the right hand argument, look at that inner lambda, the lambda x, y, plus, y times x. That is, goes lambda dot. And then hash one, that's the y, one lambda intervening between the occurrence of y and its binding site. And then the x, oh, no lambdas intervening, hash zero. So those two in De Bruyne notation, I've got lambda dot hash one plus hash zero. They look the same. If we did hash consing, they would be the same. And that would be fine for structure sharing. If our only goal was saving memory in the compiler, it would be good. 
but we're not. We're trying to do common sub-expression, and they absolutely are not the same. You cannot take lambda x t plus x and lambda x y plus x and say it's the same expression, right? So I'm hoping that everybody is saying is nodding now. I can't kind of. I can only see a few people. Les at least is nodding. Uh, people on um, on uh, Slack, please sort of. Why don't you type nod or something, and I'll see it in 30 seconds. Um, so. The point I want to get to so far is that there's a relatively simple problem. It sounds straightforward. Find all alpha equivalent sub-expressions in a perhaps large program terms. Um, but unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be an efficient compositional algorithm in the literature. And that's really surprising. I was I looked quite hard. If you know of any, please tell me about them. But that's the problem that we're going to fix in this talk. OK, and here's how we're going to fix it. Um, uh, right. So. Um, for every node, we're going to first of all define something we're calling an E summary, um, and it can. And the idea is that the E summary for a node, a bit like a hash code, can be computed from the E summaries of its immediate children. And two nodes are going to be equivalent, alpha equivalent, if they have the same E summary. But there's no information loss here. We can convert to and fro between E summaries and expressions. Um, but the reason that we want E summaries is that E summaries are e more easily hashable in a composed way. We're going to take it from the E summary. We're going to extract a hash code, and that is going to be the uh, the thing that we're going to use to determine equivalence. Of course, like any hashing mechanism, we can get um, collisions, and we just have to arrange that the collisions are sufficiently infrequent. There is a okay. question from the Slack. Oh right, which says what, what about the Bruin levels oh, counting from the outside? Good, good question. So Adam Adam says yes. The De Bruyne notation um, counts. The De Bruyne notation I've said shows. Um, counts um, uh, the occurrence has an index that is the number of intervening lambdas, you can instead count the other way around and say, how many lambdas from the top does this work? That imposes different overheads, but it doesn't solve the problem. Um, so um, the, the, it's like you nail down the carpet in one place and it pops up somewhere else. Thanks, Adam. Uh, thanks, Michelle, for reminding me. Good. So here's, a, here's our um, E summary story. First of all, we're going to extract E summary. So I'm going to focus on E summaries first, and then I'm going to extract hash codes, and then I'm going to use the hash table in exactly the way that it did before to say if two nodes have the same hash code, then I'll look up in the table to see if it's if I've got an existing copy of the same node. Now, what is an E summary? It's just a pair of the structure or shape of a, the expression and something I'll call the free variable map of the expression, which describes the places where the variables occur. That should be a plural, the variables. So um, I'm going to peel apart the expression into two pieces, the structure, the ignoring the, ver the identities of the variables, and the locations of the variables in that structure. So pictorial, I might say that this expression, lambda x, y times x, the structure part is simply spot plus spot times spot. Right, that's your, every every place I put a variable, I put a spot. Uh, the structure it, it remains, and then the free variable map says where within that structure x occurs. Well, where does x occur? Well, if I look at the root, which is a plus, it occurs in both subtrees. So I get this p both thing. Think of p both as a constructor in Haskell. So it's got two arguments. So it says, and the left-hand argument is p here, and that's because x occurs immediately in the right sub in the left subtree. In the right subtree, x doesn't occur immediately. It occurs in the right subtree of the right subtree. So we say um, the right-hand argument of p both says p right, meaning go to the right again, and then p here, meaning here it is. On the other hand, y here only occurs in the right-hand subtree of that plus node, so we get a p right, and then here occurs the left-hand subtree of the multiplication node, so we get a p left, and then there he is, p here. Okay, I'm hoping that's uh, simple enough that we just got a um, a way to identify where the um, where each of the um, uh, variables occurs, and then when we come to a lambda in the e summary in the structure, I'm going to extract the a variable map for x instead if i got this sorry if i got this lambda oh dear uh, yes i've got this lambda y i'm going to extract from the variable map remember the variable map said y occurs at it, p right to p left to p here um, so i'm going to extract that and stuff it in the lambda so instead of the name of a variable in a lambda the structure map records the places that the variable occurs and then i'm going to have the rest of the structure and i'm left with the places where x occurs okay so 
at the moment, I'm hoping you just have an intuitive idea that we can split the, um, we can describe, a, fully describe a term by a pair of uh, a structure that <clears throat> mentions no variable by name and a map that maps variables to their locations. Here's another way to look at it um, in, in pictures. Here's a, um, <clears throat> uh, this is a, uh, a different term. I, this is lambda x, lambda bx applied to b, all applied to x. Um, so if you look at the, the that multiplication node at the bottom, the structure is spot times spot, and I have a variable map that says b occurs in the right branch and x occurs in the left branch. And now when I come to the lambda, the lambda b, I extract the structure for b and put that in the lambda, leaving back a, a depleted variable map that says where x occurs. Then when I come across the multiplication node, um, uh, I'm going to say, oh, x occurs in the left-hand branch and the right-hand branch of this application node. So uh, I got a bigger var map. And then when I come across that lambda, I attach that, um, that the, the, the places that x occurs into to the lambda, leaving an empty var map. So that's the idea of these structure, structure maps. That's a lot with pictures and arm waving. Here it is in Haskell. I, I'm going to show you some Haskell code in this talk because I love showing Haskell code. And, um, and because it makes it more precise. So here is a very simple... Uh, data type describing lambda terms. So for those of you not familiar with um, Haskell, this data expert says here comes an algebraic data type and a value of type expert can be built in one of these three ways. It can be a var constructor applied to a name, maybe a name is just a string, or it can be an app node that has two expressions inside it. So the app is the constructor, expert, expert, those are its two children. Or it can be a lam node, lambda node with a name, that's the bound variable, and an expression as its child. Um, and so here is the things that I've been written as lambda x, x plus x could be written in this, um, um, in Haskell, the, the data structure that represent will be a lamb with x and then an app of an app uh, and so forth. So those are, that's expressions. Now, here are E summaries. So what is an E summary at the top of the slide? It's a pair. Right, so the the first thing, the first bit to the right of the equals is the data constructor E summary, and then it has two components: a structure and a var map. What is a structure? Well, remember, a structure just said it had this, um, uh, it was this uh, spot plus spot. So what's going to have S var? That's the spot. It says there's a variable here. I'm not going to tell you what its name is. Um, then we can have an application node in the structure part that just has two structure children, and then we're going to have a structure lamb. Remember, that's like uh, these guys, those lambdas, remember, have a, uh, a single um, position tree attached to them. So the structure lamb has a position tree attached to it and a structure as its child. What's a position tree? That's those things that I was showing for um, uh, where X and Y occur, right? So either a position tree either says... Um, uh, the variable occurs here, or it's in the... It's go to the left, or go to the right, or go both ways. That's position trees. Um, and a var map, that's the last component of an E summary. Right on the top line, you can see E summary has two components, structure and var map. What's a var map? It's a finite mapping, which I'm just here writing map, from names to what? Well, pos trees. So I hope that's just a straightforward rendition of the um, of uh, of this idea that uh, the E summary is just a pair of a structure and a free variable map. The last thing I just have to say is that uh, uh, why does an S lamb contain a maybe pos tree instead of a pos tree? It's because a variable may not occur at all. So the maybe is just saying if it doesn't occur at all, we'll have nothing. Otherwise, we'll have just pos tree. Um, you could slice this an another way, but it's easier done like this. Okay, so then summarize is going to be the, exp the function that takes an expression and delivers its E summary. And it's pretty simple. I'm not going to go through it in great detail, but I just think it's illuminating just to see a little bit of code. So how do we summarize a single variable? Well, we get an E summary. What is an E summary? It's a pair of a structure. In this case, for a variable, the structure is just S var. Uh, remember the, the, what structures are? a variable, the anonymous variables, it just has S vars. And then what is the variable map for a singleton variable? Well, just a singleton map that maps the variable to P here. For lambdas, what do we do? Well, we recursively call summarize and extract that in the where part to it, and then get the structure and the variable map out of the summary we get back. And we're going to return a summary. Oh, that's the bit after the equal sign. 
And what does that summary contain? It says it's got an SLAM, and we look up what the variable, well, you know, where's the variable in the VMAP to get the position tree for X, and then we delete the variable from the VMAP and return that. And I'm not going to through, go through application because I've got more to say about that later, but I hope that gives you a sort of simple um, idea. Do we, uh, Luke asks, you must assume that no two pos trees point to the same location. Yes, it is perfectly possible to make an e sum. E summaries, if you like, contain more values than expressions do. I could have an invalid e summary that really didn't represent any expression at all. Um, so thanks, Luke. Yes, it's a sort of redundant notation, but it's going to be compositionally hashable. That's why we that's why we have it. But of course, summarize this summarize thing will only build valid e summaries. Yeah. So. When I say you, you must assume that, um, uh, it's not exactly we assume it. It's summarize only builds e summaries with valid pos trees, um, and then we can go back the other way. But in fact, we can go back the other way. So I said it's not information losing. I think you can see that we could take an e summary and reconstruct the expression, possibly modulo the variable names um, <clears throat> themselves. Uh, and we could reconstruct the expression for which it stands. We might need to record a tiny bit inform of information if we wanted to be faithful to the variable names. Um, but you might wonder, if e summaries and expressions contain the same information, why have I bothered with all this? Like, why did I do this work? Um, because after all, I'm, I appear to be no further forward. I just have a different representation of the same expression. Well, here's why. We're going to hash the e summaries. That's the second step in this process. So I'm going to show how to compositionally hash e summaries. So um, I want to uh, extract from an e summary some kind of hash code. Um, and since an e summary is a pair of a structure and a variable map, maybe I can hash the structure and hash the variable map and then smash those two hashes together, which I've written on the bottom line. So now I have to ask, how can I hash structures and how can I hash variable maps? For structures, it's rather easy. Um, yes, I'll come back to Yunus and Alex. Thank you. Um, remind me towards the end. Uh, structures don't have any variables in them. Now, do you remember when we talked about hash consing? We said hash consing is great until you introduce lambdas. Well, structures don't have any lambdas. Um, they just have, well, Structures as children and pos trees as children. Pos trees don't have any lambda. So, in fact, structures and pos trees are totally hash consable. All right. So, idea number zero is simply to never build pos trees or structures, but instead build pos tree hashes and structure hashes. Let me say that once again. We never actually build a. Um, uh, a pos tree or a structure. We're only going to build their hashes by hash consing. So we never, we're not actually interested in those trees. We're only interested in the hashes of those trees. So here I've described hash summary then, which is a sort of, you know, like a, a, a compacted version of E summary, is a pair of a structure hash and this thing I'll call that an H var map, which is sort of hash var map. Let's concentrate on structure hash first. What is structure hash? It's just a hash code. So now, when I, let, let's say I'm now taking an expression and delivering, instead of an E summary, I want to deliver a hash summary. Hash summaries, E summaries are kind of like the same thing, but, with, but they've been smashed a bit. How do I hash a variable node? Well, I'm going to make an H summary, which I want a structure hash in the first component. How do I make a structure hash or an SVAR? Oh, I just hash SVAR. Um, now, what's this HVAR map? This HVAR map maps variables to pos tree hashes. Remember, the only thing I'm doing at the moment is I'm replacing structures with structure hashes and pos trees with pos tree hashes. I'm still leaving the variable map for now. Um, OK, so, uh, so where are we? That's right. So I need to make a singleton map of the variable to not p here, but rather hash of p here. That's the pos tree hash for p here. OK, so far, so good. Um, no questions about this um, coming through yet. For lambdas, what do I do? Well, it's the same as before. I need to recursively call hash expert, extract the variable map and the structure, well, the structure hash from, the, um, from what I get back. And then I build the structure hash, the first component of the h, hash, h summary I return. We, um, uh, we're going to just hash together the slam with the result of looking up in the vmap and, of course, the child structure. And then we delete from the vmap. 
Um, so all we're doing is we're doing exactly what we did before, but we're simply keeping hashes instead of structures and hashes instead of pos trees. So I'm hoping that part is very straightforward. Um, now, uh, Hugh is asking a good question, which is how do e-summaries deal with shadowing? Well, um, let's see if I can answer that question just by going back to one of these diagrams. So um, supposing in this picture, I'd had lambda b and the top lambda was a lambda b as well. Well, the example wouldn't work very well, but then I couldn't have had that nested lambda, but you'd still, everything would just work fine. The inner lambda would, by the time I'd done the e-summary, the inner lambda in, let's see, uh, position C here, the middle, the inner lambda would say where that anonymous variable B occurs. Um, uh, yes, that's like lambda B. And in E, the outer lambda would say where its variables occur. So since e-summaries are simply, you know, they're completely anonymous they don't have any names they just they don't have any problem with shadowing of course i mean if you have lambda x dot lambda x dot x plus x the outer lambda x it doesn't occur at all and it shouldn't it's just shadowed i mean that's just what that's just lambda lambda calculus okay so a uh, little pause here. I hope that we got to the point where we've had, um, we've sort of done the done the simple bit now. We've got, we've gone from e summaries to hash summaries, and hash summaries can have uh, just like e summaries, except we've replaced structures with structure hashes and pos trees with pos tree hashes. So we can no longer reconstruct the original expression, but we never really wanted to do that in the first place. It was just an intellectual stepping stone. We wanted to get a hash code. OK, um, so uh, nods, um, type nod if you're happy at this point, because we're about to get to the interesting bit. So uh, I'll keep an eye on nods in the next 30 seconds. So there are two elephants in the room, um, which nobody's been asking questions about. Perhaps you're very polite. Um, and here is the first elephant. Um, at an app node, there's lots of work to do. Um, now, uh, in this example, I've got an app of, I'm applying X to Y applied to X. So if you look in the bottom right app node, you can see that its var map uh, says that Y occurs in the left subtree and X occurs in the right subtree. And then in the app node, I have to combine the two var maps, the one from the left, which says x goes to p here, and the one from the right with that, that two things to make a var map for um, x and y. It still only has two elements, but the x, the x guy is in both branches, so I get a p both. And the y is only in the right-hand branch, so I have to wrap a p right um, around the p left here. So the payload of this slide is I have to look, I have to attend to every element of both var maps right and modify them right so that means in a very unbalanced tree right suppose that it wasn't nicely balanced suppose it was very unbalanced with lots of free variables then at each level of the unbalanced tree i have to do a sort of order n operation right so i've got an n deep tree at um, each level i need to i need to uh, pay attention to n things so by the time i got to the top i've done n squared work n squared work very bad, right? We don't want to. We don't want to do that. We can possibly avoid it. So that looks like a serious problem with the, uh, you know, the story I was telling you here. We didn't look at app nodes, but this is what must happen to app nodes. So here is the first clever idea. I can say it's a clever idea because I wasn't the one that had it. it. Was one of my colleagues. Why don't we only adjust the items in the smaller map? So here in the green. The, the sort of purple bit, at the, the brown bit at the bottom hasn't changed. In the green bit, X occurs in both branches, so I've had to modify that. It was in the smaller map, right, as well as the bigger one. But Y was only in the bigger map, the one on the right. So maybe I can do nothing, just pay, uh, just leave it alone, right? So then I'm only paying attention, I'm only modifying, only doing work on the smaller map, and that would be a lot more efficient. But of course, it doesn't work because now, if you um, imagine um, uh, imagine the rebuilding process, because remember, I want to be able to take one of these e summaries and reconstruct the original tree. 
how would I know? I mean, it's not true to say that the place that Y occurs in the top level app node is in P left to P here. You know, it that's true about the app node below, right? So we seem to need that extra bit of information on the Y to say um, how far to push it down. Um, but it turns out that we can be a bit cleverer here by recording in the structure two extra pieces of information. So structures still have no variables or anything, but in red here, I've added two extra pieces of information to the app. I've added the depth, which is just going to be a simple number that counts up you know, the, the, um, uh, the maximum depth of either child, I'm just keeping in the node, and a, and a single Boolean flag, bigger map, that says which side is bigger, which side has the bigger map. And then in the um, in the pos tree, I'm going to um, uh, for a p both node. I'm going to record uh, the um, both the child from the smaller map and the child from the bigger map, along with a depth tag. So now here's an example to show what happens. So here's my same example, but this time with these additional decorations. So now. Um, uh, you'll see that um, in the um, the app node at the bottom, um, Y got a P both. Why did it get a P both? Well, it was because um, uh, it was determined to be the um, the smaller map. Can you see on the on the 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 we decided the two maps on the the Y and the X at the bottom are of equal size, but we arbitrarily picked the left hand one, the Y one, to be the smaller one. Fine. So we're going to mark it with P both one, Y one, one is the depth of this app node. And X, that was the smaller map. Sorry, that was the bigger map. So we don't change that. So um, as, as, you, as the green uh, call out says, the light green call out, every item in the smaller map is going to get a P both. And all of the items in the bigger map here, X maps to P here, don't change at all. Okay, so that's the brown uh, var map on the bottommost app node. Now look at the green var map on the uppermost app node. So now here, it's definitely the right hand um, map is the bigger one. So it'll be marked as bigger. The depth of the topmost app node is two, right? It's got a child of depth one and a child of depth zero. So we add one and take the larger, so we get two. Um, and, uh, and so now, uh, remember when we do combining, we every item in the smaller map gets a p both. So in that topmost green variable map, x gets a p both marked at depth two, um, and y we haven't changed at all. It's the same as in the little brown var map from the uh, the right hand child. Um, but now you can see that if we imagine inverting the process and trying to split these variable maps as we rebuild. Um, at this depth two node, we would know that that P both two is something we must split, but the P both one, no, 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 we're not going to split that guy. We're just going to pass it down. Where are we going to pass it down to? To the bigger map. In other words, to the right hand child, right? So we've recorded just enough information in the structure to enable us to split these maps, even though the maps themselves have got, you know, the larger part was never modified. So that's the, that is the hardest bit of this talk. It is a little bit subtle, but it, the nice thing is that if you go back to the, the old E summaries and do all this with um, uh, structures, you can actually write summarize and rebuild, and you can check, you know, you can use quick check to check that you really have, or you can prove that you really have got a perfect inversion. You can take an expression, you can generate an E summary. From the E summary, you can generate the expression. Now, how expensive is this? Well, we're only adjusting the items in the smaller map. In that very unbalanced tree, the smaller map always has size zero. That was cool, right? No work there. We're happy. So in fact, the worst case is when the map is when the tree is balanced. Now, if it's completely balanced, then I'm going to do work um, on you know the smaller tree and the bigger tree, the same size, right? But at the bottom layer of the a bottom layer of the tree, I've got n nodes and I have to do work one. At the next layer of the tree, I've got half as many nodes. I'm assuming a binary tree here, but each time I have to do work two because you know, I've got a bigger variable map. The next level, I've got n over four nodes, but I have to do work four because then again, the variable map or the smaller variable map is still of size four, right? But this is fine because at each level here, I'm doing work n, right? 
bottom level, work n. Next level, n over 2 times 2. Next level, n over 4 times 4. So the total amount of work I do is n log n. And as we all know, n log n is happy, happy space, right? n squared, very bad. n log n, happy. After all, log n is essentially a constant factor. The number of protons in the universe is only, you know, 2 to the 70 or something. So it's uh, n log n is just, you know, constant times n to all intents and purposes. Um, it's a lot smaller than n squared. Okay, so far so good. Let's see. Any questions? Very happy. Nods? Um, no, uh, no questions. So it was, um, there was one, sorry. Adam, there was one yes. back, back there. Yes. From Adam, could there be benefits to using the pos tree in substitution, for example? Instead of traversing the whole expression, you know exactly where to go. I hadn't thought of that, Adam. So you may be saying, could there be. Could there be examples in a compiler that was doing, let's say, program transformations and doing beta reductions on lambda terms? Maybe instead of lambda terms, we should just work with e-summaries. Would that be cool? Huh, I had not thought of that. That is an interesting question. I will leave it as a question for the audience to discuss in Slack after this talk. Um, my suspicion is that it, the carpet would pop up somewhere else, but it's a good question. Alex asks, is n roughly the size of the function top level definition? Oh, uh, so, so what is n here? So in my pictures here, I'm thinking of the expression as being the whole program, right? So in a Haskell program, for example, the whole program is a large collection of definitions. But you could think of it as an enormous let in which you go, let function one equal right hand side one, in let function two equal right hand side two, in value of main. So just think of the whole program as one giant expression, and we want to do common sub-expression on that. So I'm thinking of n as just being um, um, the, the whole program. Or at least I'd like these algorithms to work regardless of how big an expression we're working on. OK. So now we've gotten, um, now we're working on the smaller map. That's good. So we've, uh, we've, re we've eliminated elephant one um, by do only working on the smaller subtree. But elephant two is that we have to, we still have to hash these variable maps. Remember my hash summary, it's a, it's a, it's a pair of a structure hash and an HVAR map. Now I need to get the hash, a single hash code for a hash summary. So I might hash together the structure hash and O, the variable map. So does that mean that at every node I need to hash together. I need, I need At every node, then, I need to construct the hash of the variable map. How do I do that? Well, a variable map, just think of it as a set of key value pairs, maybe even a, an ordered sequence of key value pairs. I could hash that list, but that would take time, order, size of the map. And that doesn't sound good. So could I do that in an incremental way? Well, you might think maybe I could maintain on the side, you know, the the variable that the hash of that map, right? Uh, so I could keep a pair of uh, an HVAR map, which is um, you know so H summaries now have three components. It still has an HVAR map, but it also has the hash of the HVAR map. So now whenever I add something to the HVAR map, I can just you know hash a new element into the VAR map hash, and we sound happy. But it's not very good when you're deleting. Oh dear, how can we um, uh, delete something? If I've, got the, if I've got the hash of a variable map and I delete something from the variable map, how do I get the hash of the depleted variable map? Ugh, that is a problem. I hope you see that's a problem. You can type nod at this point. Um, and it looked, it looked sort of ineluctable because, because uh, this business about building hash codes as you go, a bit like hash consing, it constructs hashes for bigger things by combining the hashes of smaller things. But when we delete something from a variable map, we are making the variable map smaller. And so we've got, we got to sort of remove some bits from the hash. That's really hard. How can we do that? So here is the second good idea. Use exclusive or. So the hash of a variable map is going to be the exclusive or of the hashes of its key value pairs. So now, so you have to suspend belief at the moment. For what, we're, we're, we're doing something that, that looks weak, right? But I'll come back to that. But if 
we define the hash of a verbal map to be the exclusive or of the hashes of its key value pairs. Then we can delete a key value pair from the hash by XORing the hash in again, right? So here is the code for hash for, for hashing a lambda. Uh, and look at the um, uh, look at the bottom. We're going to um, uh, we're going to MPT. Um, whose type is maybe positive is the result of looking up the variable in the var mac. Remember, so what I get back is a maybe. Oh, that should be maybe positive hash. Sorry, that's a maybe positive hash. Um, then I look at that um, um, that uh, maybe positive. If it's nothing, it means well the variable wasn't in the variable map, so there's nothing to do. But if I get a if there's a positive hash there, then I can delete it, from, delete the variable from the variable map, and just XOR the hash of the key value pairs with the verbal map hash. Oh, that's so nice, isn't it? It means as well as adding things, I can remove things. Um, and moreover, since exclusive or is commutative and associative, it doesn't matter whether I add A and then B or whether I add B and then A, I get the same hash. Okay, so Les at least is nodding. This is good. So the worry you might have is you might get too many collisions. Right, because the whole point of doing this hash is—I mean, I could have could have said it would all be correct if I said the hash of a variable map is seven. Right, always seven. Then I just get well a lot of collisions. Uh, what what's bad about collisions? Well, when I'm looking up two things, I'm I'm taking a term and I say these two terms have the same hash code. Are they the same expression? Well, I have to look in the hash table and see if I got a collision. I have to, have to because every hash table bucket is going to have a list of all the expressions that mapped to that bucket. This is always the true with true with hashing. So we can't just say because they've got the same hash code, they must be equal. No, hashing loses information. So in the hash table, there's a list of expressions. So if two things have the same hash code, they're going to map to the same slot. I have to look sequentially up in that list of expressions and um, see which, see whether whether it's a member of that list. And I don't so I, I I don't want many collisions. If a var map hash was always seven, everything would work fine. But I get lots of collisions slow. So I want to get few collisions. So the question is, does XOR screw up the few collision argument? And the answer is, it does not. And for this, you'll have to read the paper. I'm not going to go through it here. Um, it's going to um, um, we are, um, are not going to get a lot of extra false collisions. So the, the sort of rough summary is when you're doing hashing for sets, if you've got strong hashes for the elements of the set, then using XOR to compute the hash of the set is fine. That's the insight. Isn't that a great insight? I, I, I really like that. So it means that you can, um, uh, you can uh, get... Um, uh, you know, low collision hashing, even when you're deleting things from the variable map. So, uh, does it? Um, Fraser asks, does it work with any commutative group? Um, so, I think you're saying, could I have used something other than XOR? Um, and I believe, yes, I believe that in the paper, um, the proof doesn't. In, uh, I believe that we're explicit about what properties of XOR we need, and I think probably it's just that it's. Um, commutative and associative, and that the the additional property that XOR also um, uh, is sort of self-inverse, you can, if you XOR it twice, is the extra piece that we need to do the deletion. But I think, read the paper to check, um, that it's just the commutative and associative that makes it um, okay for um, hashing. Okay, uh, where have we got to? Um, so, We've reduced from n squared complexity to n log n squared. The, the log n squared, again, you have to read the paper to see why it's a square, but it's still um, fine in practice. And, it, and we did that by um, extracting, instead of regarding expressions with uh, variables inside it, inside it, we extract into two parts, the structure and a variable map. Then we had three ideas. Firstly, using ordinary hash consing for structure and pos tree. Secondly, leaving the larger map alone, which meant doing some modifications to structure and pos tree so that we could leave the larger map alone when summarizing app nodes. And the third idea was using XOR to hash file maps. Um, and to reason about how this works, so it's really easy to screw up here. If we had gone all the way from expressions instantly to this hashing mechanism, I wouldn't be so confident that we hadn't screwed up. But by defining an information preserving 
um, summarized that goes from expressions to e-summaries, where the e-summaries contain these depth and um, and um, uh, depth and structure tag stuff. Um, and making sure that that is a true inverse with expression, that means I can guarantee that those e-summaries are not information losing. Now I can do the hashing, and I only have to think about the information the hashing is losing. It's a sort of separate thing. I, I've not accidentally, um, I've got not got not got accidental collisions through, you know, having, for example, forgotten a depth tag. Um, right. So the 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 um, the intermediate step was very helpful in reassuring us that we had got a, a local, you know, we could prove that we had low collisions. Uh, does it work in practice? Well, of course, since we proved it, it must. Um, but here, is, here are some actual numbers, uh, which you'll see in the paper. Um, so this, this first slide is about numbers on synthetic benchmarks. So here the synthetic test cases are um, in the in the left hand figure, there are fully balanced expressions. In the right hand figure, it's very very unbalanced expressions. Um, so when they're balanced, then everything is a sort of um, uh, um, you know it, it works pretty similarly. The 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 um, uh, the green circles is the stuff that I've shown you, and low is good. So it looks as if the the uh, orange triangles and the red squares are better and they are but they are wrong right they get lots of false positives and false negatives the crosses which i call it locally nameless here a bit more in the paper is correct um and it turns out to actually be slower than our algorithm it is another correct algorithm but for the unbalanced expression locally nameless has a different complexity right it's asymptotically worse so we're better in constant factor and asymptotically than locally nameless so in short this is the green circles are the best algorithm we know that works um and here is a more realistic test case this was a some big expressions generated by you know from uh, a sort of machine learning related um big expression um and uh, sure enough uh, we're a lot better even on realistic examples than the locally nameless which is correct not as good as the incorrect de Bruyne and structural things but of course if, stru if structural is what you want you don't care about common expression then you're better off with ordinary hash consi so this is my conclusion um and then we'll stop and have any um uh, conversation that we want uh i think i found it surprising that there was this sort of gap in the literature right seems like an obvious question to ask and yet i couldn't find one so please tell me if you know any um the algorithm, I think you'll be, you'll believe me, it's is is a little bit subtle. Kind of, I'm really thrilled to see Alex saying it seems so obvious now, but that is my goal. I think it's. I look back and I think, why didn't we see that? You can't you can't believe how long we spent thrashing around trying to find this. Um, so it's a nice, simple, ultimately simple. Certainly in code terms, it's very simple, but it's very satisfying and it's quite efficient. Um, and I really like the way that we had to use, you know, some mathematics and some formal reasoning to actually get algorithmic improvements in something you might want to do in practice. Thank you very much. Let's um uh